Clinton, a small town in northern New Jersey, is known for its perfect view. Every part of it, the stone mill, the red mill, the cliff behind them, the dam, the singing waterfall, and the endlessly flowing river seems to come together in a natural form. Clinton possesses a beautiful view, but nothing beautiful comes without a price. This is the story of John W. Bray, the man who gave the name to Clinton. In the third decade of the 1800s, America had grown from its infancy into maturity. With a total of 24 states and almost 30 million people, Americans were on the march toward a new era. When Andrew Jackson became the president in 1828, the Industrial Revolution also brought forth new technologies, transforming the landscape of the continent. People flooded the territory of the West, their spirits high, eager to live in a new land of promise and opportunity. During the Industrial uh, Revolution, there was a lot of stories that came about. And, and one really interesting one is this individual, this gentleman out of Philadelphia, his name was Oliver Evans, and he was fascinated by steam engines, but couldn't get any investors to back him so that he could build the, the steam engine for the locomotive. and. What he wound up doing was, was building an automated grain mill, but again, couldn't get anyone, any of the millers to then try it. So it wasn't until 1804 where he developed a high pressure steam engine that his luck took a turn for the better. And it, it's a steam engine that was used not only on ships, but in factories as well. John W. Bray grew up in this promising era, an ordinary citizen from Lebanon, New Jersey, a village in the same neighborhood as Clinton. Although his journey was full of great failure and dishonesty, his life was imbued with the spirit of the time period, driven by a desire to work hard, take risks, and strive for success. John Watson Bray was born in 1788. The village of Clinton had just a handful of people, a couple of houses, and the stone mill. Locals recognized this place as Hunt's Mill Village, named after the Daniel Hunt's family, the largest landowners and the owners of the mill. By the time John Watson Bray grew into adulthood, the village had already functioned as a small business center for decades. The Hunts family provided services at the mill for surrounding farmers, grinding flour and trading goods. Later, 
In 1810, the family built another mill across the river to increase production, including the weaving of wool fabrics. Roads were constructed, coaches traveled through the village, taking people and goods in and out. Business was booming. The village was expanding. During this time, Hunts Mill Village, as the town was called, was experiencing the same sense of excitement as the whole country. Vast numbers of people had started to move into the Western territories. New England saw the growth of textile mills and what had been farm fields. And of course, the famous Erie Canal had been built, which allowed products to move from east to west. The steamboat was crowding the rivers, and the fields of Alabama and Mississippi were white with cotton. A whole new country was being born, and in this country, enthusiasm was the order of the day. John W. Bray believed that he possessed a natural talent for business. He decided to start his own. He began financial ventures in the village, bought land, built houses and taverns, and opened up a store to trade goods. John seemed to sense where there was money to be made and would take any risk for it. Some said it might have something to do with his proud family, his grandfather Andrew Bray, his father John Watson Bray Sr., and his eldest brother had all fought in the War of American Independence. He must have grown up listening to riveting stories of the Revolutionary War, the first-hand accounts experienced by his own father, a lieutenant in the Lebanon militia, and his grandfather. Some believe that his risk-taking personality was built on the new American spirit. He was encouraged at an early age to do something bigger, to create something meaningful. All that was under his family's strong influence. Those influences give a reasonable explanation as to why John W. Bray, a man who always wanted to do more, became such an important figure in the history of Clinton. A man's character can be shaped by many circumstances. At the time, the nation was welcoming a new president, Andrew Jackson, who came from a very humble background. And younger generations, which would have included John Bray, were very influenced by stories of esteemed men like Jackson. They looked up at him and thought, you know, someday I can do this too. However, the reality is that um, at, during that period, the common folks were the common folks, and there was really never a true sense of social or economic equality achieved. But still, that being said, John Bray really aspired to the American dream. 1828. That year, John W. Bray was about to turn 40. In his folks' eyes, he was a well-established man. He married Mary Grandin, a woman from a local well-to-do family. Her father, Field Grandin, was a local physician. The Brays had three beautiful children. John owned slaves and servants. He had more than enough money to feed his family. He lived well, but it never seemed to be enough for him. That year, John W. Bray seemed to awaken with the thought that he had accomplished nothing by the age of 40. The goal he had set for himself still felt far away. To him, the idea of growing old as an ordinary man seemed intolerable. Three years before, at a 4th of July party, he had proudly raised his glass and made a great remark. New Jersey, would become as important to the U.S. manufacturing as the British towns of Manchester and Birmingham were to the English. At that moment, he still felt that he was full of life, full of energy, and that excitement had caught the attention of the new Flemington paper, the Hunterdon Gazette. As he entered his 40th year, Bray was filled with overwhelming desire to prove his true worth. It's not hard to understand John Bray's desire to make a success of himself. The country had become a sovereign nation, and now a powerful nation as it challenged the countries of Europe for control of the lands in the middle of the United States. 
Excitement was everywhere. John Bray must have thought, well, if my brother can go west to find gold, maybe I can find success here in the east. In 1828, an opportunity arrived that would change John forever. Ralph Hunt's business was in trouble. The mill property was listed on the market, forced to be sold by the sheriff. Under Ralph Hunt, the two mills failed, partially because of poor business decisions. He decided to build the Red Mill in 1810 in order to manufacture cloth. But after the War of 1812 and the Industrial Revolution, Britain became the major manufacturer of woolen goods, and they exported many of those goods to the U.S. at very low prices. He couldn't compete. His income fell, and he couldn't pay his mortgage. The two mills were prime real estate in the village. They were the center for business. They suited Bray's desires perfectly. Whether it was because he didn't have the money or for another reason, John W. Bray didn't enter the bid for ownership of the mill property. Instead, he pushed Archibald S. Taylor, his brother-in-law, to buy it. Bray seemed to have a good proposal. He'd let his brother-in-law own the mills while he would run the business. Bray believed Archibald S. Taylor was an ideal candidate to own the mill property. He had massive amount of money, and he was the original creditor of the property under the Hunt family. Archibald S. Taylor was a very wealthy man. He lived on the hillside of Highbridge, a couple miles from John Bray's village. He grew up in an affluent family. His father, Robert Taylor, was a wealthy landowner and the owner of Union Ironworks in Highbridge. When his father died, Archibald S. Taylor inherited his family's properties, including the Iron Company, his most important source of income. Archibald S. Taylor courted John Bray's older sister, Anne Nancy Bray, and the two later married. Archibald and John W. Bray became brother-in-laws. Archibald Taylor was another interesting individual. He was a handsome and well-educated gentleman, um, very easygoing personality. And what's really kind of interesting is he grew up in a wealthy family and didn't become an independent businessman until he was almost 40 years old. And that was when his father, Robert Taylor, passed away in 1823. He took over the Union Iron Works in Highbridge. And at that time, as the Highbridge real estate became more valuable, Archibald actually became wealthier and wealthier. Over the years, Archibald S. Taylor and his wife had five children and raised them in a very large mansion in Highbridge. Their eldest son of the family was John B. Taylor. Young Taylor seemed to hold his uncle Bray in high esteem. There's a strong indication that John Bray was a frequent visitor to the Taylor home, visiting his sister as well as his favorite nephew. To young Taylor, Uncle Bray was an important man. He was popular in the village. The two got along very well. The relationship explains why John B. Taylor grew up wanting to become a businessman like Bray, while his younger brother, George S. Taylor, chose to join the U.S. Navy to see the world and later became a high-ranking officer of the Army who fought in the Civil War. John Taylor was by his Uncle Bray's side at the Fourth of July party in 1825 after his uncle, Bray, made a toast wishing New Jersey would become the manufacturing center for America. Young Taylor echoed his tone, wishing General de Lafayette a safe journey back to France and saluted Lafayette as a defender of our rights. It's impossible to know how important John Bray was to John Taylor, his nephew's life, but we think he was probably his main role model. The younger Taylor's father had inherited his wealth, but Bray was a self-made man, and that was probably inspirational to the younger Taylor. The relationship between these two families became John W. Bray's most valuable asset in the struggle to convince Archibald S. Taylor to commit to the mill purchase. John Bray was an important man in the community, and he also had the power to influence people. 
One person he desperately wanted to influence was Archibald Taylor, his brother-in-law. Taylor had become a success probably more by inheritance rather than skill, as he had inherited a lot of money from his father. Bray's job was to influence Taylor and see if he would invest in his new project. The sale of the mills created a critical turning point in John W. Bray's life. If he can convince Archibald to invest in the property, Bray was convinced it would change the course of his life forever. Whether John Bray did any serious financial calculations about his project, that we don't know. But we know he worked very hard to encourage his brother, Archibald Taylor, to invest up to $20,000. He said to Taylor that he would lease the property from him, pay $1,200 a year, and success was guaranteed. No way could they fail. However, it wasn't that easy to convince Archibald S. Taylor. In fact, for a while, Taylor refused to talk about buying the mills at all. Simply put, he didn't want to invest in something he did not know. Archibald S. Taylor had only driven past the village once for a funeral. He had never even seen the property Bray was talking about. Archibald Taylor didn't really know the mills at all, didn't really care about them, except for the fact that he was the creditor. He held the mortgage in the amount of $12,605. But that was the extent of his interest in the mills, until Bray convinced him that they would be valuable and that they were worthy of his attention. John W. Bray successfully influenced Archibald's decision. First, Bray offered to rent the mills as a tenant for $12,000 per year to assure Archibald's investment had a basic guarantee. Bray made a solid promise that he would allow John B. Taylor to purchase half the stock of his existing store, making him a full partner. John W. Bray pointed out that this investment was not just for Archibald S. Taylor himself, however, also for his son, because young Taylor was a 50% shareholder of the business. This partnership would make a lot of money. Archibald S. Taylor decided to purchase the mills and won the bid for the property at a price of $15,820. John Taylor might have been the deciding factor in the mill deal. Wanting the best future for his son, Archibald Taylor took John Bray's advice and purchased the property for $15,800. He spent another $3,800 buying half shares in the interests of Bray's current businesses. Now, he took quite a big chance at the time, but he wanted his son to, to learn about, the, you know, about business. And on top of that, John Taylor must have been pretty excited to be learning from such a great businessman as his Uncle Bray. Everything John W. Bray had once dreamed about seemed to be coming into fruition. He was now in control of the biggest business outlet in the village. The success of becoming a wealthy businessman was almost within his grasp. John W. Bray was headed toward his dream at full speed. To start, Bray and his nephew reorganized business structure. Besides taking over Hunt's existing business, including the post office, they expanded and incorporated other services, making oil cake meal, ground plaster, amongst other things. How much profit John W. Bray could make was still up in the air, but he had no problem spending Archibald S. Taylor's money. As soon as he started the operation in that spring, he informed Archibald that the two mills, especially the stone mill, would need some improvement. More of Taylor's money poured into the mill investment. A new mercantile era appeared to dawn, the locals declared as the mill businesses seemed to flourish.
Besides being involved in his businesses, John Bray was very involved in a lot of the local social activities there. He was um, he was very big proponent of um, reforming the school system, and he was also very involved politically. He was a, he was a staunch Jacksonian, and in 1826, along with William Hunt, they represented Lebanon Township at the state convention in Trenton. That year, news arrived that devastated the small village. One of the most influential politicians at that time, former New York State Governor DeWitt Clinton, had died. DeWitt Clinton was a very popular politician during the time he lived. He had served as Senator of New York State, Mayor of New York City, and two terms as Governor of New York State. He also was the major driving force for the construction of the Erie Canal, where he believed the infrastructure could transform American lives. To honor the great politician's legacy, John W. Bray and his nephew, John B. Taylor, declared that the name of their village should be changed to Clinton. There's no actual record showing who named the town Clinton, but a number of published books favor the idea that it was John Bray. And, and it fits in with Bray's personality. He was passionate, he was optimistic for success, and he was very active in the village, and he wanted to make a name for himself. So um, you, you could see that would be a perfectly logical thing for to people to assume. Now, by 1828, there were quite a few business people and residents in the community, so something like changing the name of the town would have had to come up as some kind of village vote or for something in a group to decide upon. In 1828, Old Hunts Mill was officially renamed. Local residents adopted the new name, Clinton. I think likely O'Shar will move up to Miss Johnson's and take the store as your Uncle Bray and John intends giving it up and having their own business less complicated. My dear George, Clinton now looks very pretty. You will hardly know the place when you return. Taylor didn't pay much attention on how money would be made. On the surface, things appeared to be going well. He was glad to see his eldest son, John B. Taylor, finally have his own career. He was especially happy that he had found a girl, Susan Adeline, and sought permission to marry her. On March 20th, 1830, John B. Taylor married Susan. They moved to Clinton and lived in a house on the corner of what is now Main Street and Lee Street, only a block away from the mills. The village had undergone many changes since Bray and Young Taylor began their partnership. In those years, more people were attracted to the area. They built houses and many businessmen set up shops on both sides of the river. Clinton was bustling, but one thing it lacked was a church. Not hard to understand why Clinton wanted a church. A church was a place that was very important for social activity. And it wasn't just a place, place to preach the gospel. Uh, friends gathered there and families gathered there and they enjoyed picnics and singing and dancing and, uh, and plenty of other social activities. For a long time, the people of Clinton had to travel great distances to worship. They can go to the nearest church in Bethlehem or simply study gospel in a little Sunday school built in 1825. Villagers began to voice their desire for a church of their own. Building a place of worship became an urgent topic of the town's agenda. Leading citizens of Clinton, especially John W. Bray, were essential in turning the desire into reality. 
In a meeting in late 1829, John W. Bray, John B. Taylor, Archibald S. Taylor, A.C. Dunham, and A.W. Dunham formed a board of trustees. Bray donated some of his land for the church site. They started to build a Presbyterian church in May 1830 and completed the building before Christmas. As Bray and Taylor were busy running the mill business, their wives were busy running their social lives in the village, taking care of their children and joining in church activities. On October 6th, 1833, under the guidance of Pastor Macklin and John W. Bray's wife, Mary Bray, and John B. Taylor's wife, Susan Adeline, along with three other women in the village, formed the Ladies Missionary Society. On the surface, everything seemed to be going smoothly, just as John W. Bray had planned. After the successful establishment of the Clinton's own Presbyterian Church, Bray turned his focus back to his business. He and young John Taylor wanted to expand. They put multiple advertisements in the Hunter and Gazette paper. Bray spent another $4,000 to build a new store to make his own business stand out. To increase his customer's base, Bray marketed his goods in more places, sending products as far as New Brunswick. For which all kinds of grain will be taken in payment. The subscribers will also exchange ground for stone plaster by receiving the pay for grinding. Bray and Taylor, Clinton, New Jersey, March 6, 1829, formerly Hunts Mills. But Archibald S. Taylor struggled to see profit from the increasing amount of money they were spending on the mill business. Alarm came when John started to build a new store. Archibald S. Taylor was told it would only cost about $1,000, but the final cost reached about $4,000, three times higher than the original estimate. Taylor's confidence in John Bray as a good businessman was waning. Now, after about four years of continuous investment, Archibald S. Taylor became suspicious. He asked to check John Bray's accounting books, but Bray kept avoiding his requests, insisting everything was fine. Ultimately, Archibald S. Taylor came to the realization that John W. Bray had mounted tremendous debts when he started to hear inquiries from several banks. By the time Archibald S. Taylor was able to piece the correct accounting information together, the total debts had topped $33,404. He frequently called on me and expressed his high estimation of value to the Clinton property and advised me to purchase it, as I was not qualified to engage in any at the time. This I repeatedly refused to do, but he repeatedly urged and used many arguments to induce me to purchase. Amongst others, he represented that it would someday be advantageous for my children to engage in business. Archibald Taylor had no other option but to dissolve the business. It was a tremendous loss. News of the collapse of Bray and Taylor's business caused by John W. Bray's unethical business behavior traveled to every corner of the village. The Presbyterian Church was called on for an intervention. The role of the church played in people's lives is so much different than it is today. The church was the, the moral watchdog for uh, the congregation. Members would confess everything to their church regardless of people's privacy and when bad behavior or bad business misconduct took place like John Bray, it was the church's responsibility to discipline uh, that church member. John W. Bray was then expelled from the Presbyterian Church. In 1834, Archibald S. Taylor sold the mill property to John W. Snyder for $8,250 in great pain. 
dishonorable failure of worldly business, and a subsequent conduct totally inconsistent with the order and the discipline of Christ's house. After John Bray's financial disaster, a number of friends encouraged Archibald Taylor to take him to court, but Archibald didn't follow that path, and I, I think there were a number of reasons for that. Uh, first off, Archibald was concerned about his own business reputation, and he didn't want the news to get out about how much money had been lost on his watch. Secondly, I think he knew in some way that there was no way he was going to get this money back, so he might as well just let it go. And lastly, you have to remember that his wife was John Bray's brother, so just imagine the complicated financial uh, family dynamics there if, if he took him to court. In high contrast from its struggled past, the mills are so peaceful now. The river soothingly rushes by, and often people can be found fishing in the mill's shadows. Standing in front of the beautiful structures, one strong feeling comes to mind, reflected in how it's described by many visitors. It's perfect. It's perfect. 